And we're going to talk now a little bit about uh, where the Republican Party goes from here. And uh, two people who are worth listening to are with us this morning uh, in Louisiana. The governor, Bobby Jindal, here in our studio, uh, Newt Gingrich. Uh, governor Jindal, uh, there's no question now the Republicans have got a lot of work to do. What, what should be the first thing they do? Bob, well, thank you for having me this morning. Clearly, first of all, we need to congratulate Senator Ele uh, President-elect uh, Obama. I think Senator McCain was very gracious on election night. As Republicans, we need to do three things to get back on track. Number one, we've got to stop defending the kind of spending and, and out-of-control spending that we would never have tolerated on the other side. You know, when voters tell us that they trust Democrats more to cut their taxes, control spending, that tells you something is wrong with the Republican Party. We've got to match our actions with our rhetoric. Number two, we've got to stop defending the kinds of corruption we'd have rightfully criticized in the other party. The week before the election, our most senior senator is convicted on federal charges, and that's only the latest example. Number three, we've got to be the party that offers real solutions to the problems that American wo voters, American families, are worried about. We don't need to abandon our conservative principles, but we, need, we can't just be the party of no. We need to offer real solutions on making health care more affordable, uh, on the economic challenges facing families, on the international threats. I think we're going to have a debate in this country. I'm opposed to a single-payer, government-run health care system, but that's not enough. We need to also show the American people that we're for tax credits were for using technology to emphasize preventative primary care electronic patient records mm -hmm. so every American has access to affordable private coverage. All right. Uh, Newt Gingrich, do you think that there was any way John McCain could have won this election? Oh, in theory, sure. There, there were ways to win the election, but I think once the Wall Street crisis occurred and once you had President Bush on television for 18 straight days, it became extraordinarily hard. Uh, by election day, President Bush's job approval was between 19 and 23 percent. So McCain ran somewhere between 23 and 27 percent ahead of President Bush's job approval. That's a, I mean, you can't ask a lot more out of a candidate than that. But I, th I think uh, you're interviewing one of the people who's part of our future. When you look at the governors and you look at Governor Jindal and what he's doing in Louisiana, you look at Governor Mitch Daniels, who won by 20 points in Indiana while McCain was losing it. You look at Governor John Huntsman, who has the lowest employment rate in the entire West in, in Utah and a billion-dollar surplus last year, about a $300 million surplus this year. Now, there are a lot of lessons to be learned out there. And everywhere I turn, I find governors who are doing a very good job. Uh, governor Mark Sanford of South Carolina, who just took over the Republican Governors Association. So I've been through this. You know, you and I have been around long enough. Mm -hmm. I've been through the 64 collapse when the Republican Party was going to disappear and the 74 Watergate collapse when the Republican Party was going to disappear and the 92 defeat of President Bush. Uh, and, and in each case, I watched us within a short time focus on new ideas and new solutions and within a very short time come back as a, a stronger and healthier party. So, so what happened, Governor Jindal, at the Republican Governor's Conference there where you heard what uh, uh, Newt Gingrich just said? It turns out that Sarah oh, Palin I stole the show. Was that a good thing for Republicans? Well, <clears throat> well a couple of things. One, I think it's great for Republicans to have governors and others speaking out. We need as many uh, as many messengers, but it's not the messengers, it's the substance, it's the message that's important. I know the pundits want to start looking at 2012. What's more important is what the speaker said. He's exactly right. Remember when he became speaker in the 90s, you had governors solving problems in states across the country. You had governors in Utah, Michigan, Wisconsin, for example, championing welfare reform. You had Republican governors saying, let's actually help people go back to work, help them get education. Let's believe in the American dream. Let's believe that every American wants a better quality of life for their families. Critics said it wouldn't work. They brought those ideas to Washington. We saw the largest drop in poverty mm -hmm. rates, largest drop in teenage pregnancy rates across the country. I think the challenge for the Republican Party is to be gracious, work across party lines every chance we can, but to stand on principle when we disagree with the new administration, but most importantly, to offer real solutions. I think governors can offer examples maybe, of what works across the maybe, country, and that's what this RGA meeting was about. Maybe my memory is playing tricks on me, but I thought I asked something about uh, Sarah Palin there. <laughs> oh, well, sure. No, I think it's great that Sarah Palin is speaking out. I think it's great that the governors that the speaker mentioned uh, were, were, are speaking out. I, I think the future, I, I think the governors are going to play a, a great role. And I think that, you know, our folks in Washington are going to have important work to do, but I don't think all the answers and wisdom are going to be in Washington, D.C. So I think it's a great thing that she's speaking out. I think we're, How do you we're feel need about multiple that, governors. Uh, how do you feel about that, uh, Mr. Gingrich? Well, I mean, first, first of all, Governor Palin is a real asset to the Republican Party. She brought enormous energy to the party. She attracted very large crowds. 
But I would say, for example, to the Republicans who are about to face this question of how do you get the economy growing again, bring in uh, Governor Daniels and bring in Governor Huntsman and ask them, you know, how did they get to the lowest unemployment rate in their respective regions? Uh, go back to a principled approach. If you want to understand health care, you can do a lot worse than to bring in Bobby Jindal, who may, be, may well know more about health policy than any other elected official in America and is doing an extraordinary job in Louisiana. If you want to look at education reform, you can look at Governor Purdue in Georgia. You can look at, at uh, Governor Haley Barber in Mississippi. There are a lot of people doing smart things. The natural pattern of the news media is going to be, they know how to spell Sarah Palin's name. They've got it locked in their word processor. She's going to be a much bigger story in the short run. But I think as she goes back to be governor and as she works in Alaska, you're going to see a group of governors emerge, not just Sarah Palin. And there are 36 governorships up in uh, 2010. And I think focusing on rebuilding the Republican Party from state legislature and governor to Senate and House is the right model. And I think that the Republican Governors Association is probably more important than the Republican National Committee in trying to get this done. So you do not see her as the de facto leader of the party at this no, point? No, she's a wonderfully intelligent, aggressive, hardworking person who got you know, hammered very badly by the press in, I think, fairly distorted ways. But I think that she is going to be a significant player. Uh, but she's going to be one of 20 or 30 significant players. She's not going to be the de facto leader. I want to run by a couple of statistics by both of you. Uh, in 1980, Ronald Reagan got 14 percent of the black vote. Uh, this year, John McCain got 4 percent. Now, that's understandable. You had the first African-American candidate, and I think both of you would agree he was a very good candidate who ran a good campaign. But look at the rest of this. Ronald Reagan got 37 percent of the Hispanic vote. George Bush got 44 percent, John McCain 31 uh, percent. Ronald Reagan in 1984 got 61 percent of the youth vote, John McCain got 32 percent. Now doesn't that tell you that, that you well, have been second, concentrating Bob. on the wrong on, things wait, wait here? A second. You take Reagan's greatest reelection in say 84 and McCain's defeat and you compare them and guess what? The guy who lost got fewer votes. Well, but, but that was Reagan's greatest single vote. Now, I, look, I think... But doesn't that mean that yeah. you're concentrating? Haven't you put too much uh, emphasis on social issues right. here and not enough on, uh, on issues? You know what the number one issue was this fall? The number one issue this fall was that the Bush administration had failed, okay, and that the Republicans in the House and Senate had failed. This was a performance election. You're a 20, 25, 30-year-old person, and you look at this mess and you say, gosh... Do I like this attractive new articulate candidate named Obama who's for, who's for change we can depend on, or do I want to vote for the party that has just been failing? Now, I think we have temporarily a big problem. I think if uh, President-elect Obama uh, is uh, brilliant and, and committed and lucky, uh, he might well consolidate that vote. On the other hand, if they watch what you just had in the first half of this show and you end up with Congress bailing out billions to failing companies, and those 20-year-olds and 30-year-olds start to figure out they're going to pay the taxes. They're not getting the billions. I think you might find a lot of dissatisfaction by next summer. How about you, Governor General? What about this bailout? Well, I think the, the speaker is right. I think the American voters, American taxpayers are, are rightfully skeptical. You go back to September, what we heard from Washington was it was absolutely urgent they passed this bill right away. And then since then, we've heard multiple different explanations of how they're going to spend this money. Uh, I think taxpayers are right to say, one, we're the ones that are going to be paying the bills. Secondly, they're looking for competence. I think this election certainly shows us that the American people, are, I think we still live in a center-right country, but they're looking for competence. They're looking for real solutions. To your earlier question, I think the Republican Party needs to fight for every single vote. I don't believe that you win or lose elections based on identity politics. I think you build majority coalitions by showing that we want every single American to be able to live the American dream. And I think we do that by offering real solutions. I think as we do that, we can do what Reagan did. He got those so-called Reagan Democrats to vote for a Republican candidate, not based on party affiliation, but because he had the best ideas, the best qualifications to help them send their kids to better schools, earn more in their careers, and have access to affordable health care. So what he is saying, and I think you agree, uh, people voted against incompetence, not against ideology. I think that's right. And if you look at, at uh, well, I, uh, Senator, let me just say for a second, Bobby, uh, if you look at Senator uh, sure. Obama's campaign, he's promising a middle class tax cut. That was a Reaganite position. All right. Well, gentlemen, I want to thank you both I very think that, much. Very much. Thank you very much, Governor. Thank you, uh, Mr. Speaker.